All right. I'm Tom Monahan, the Ward 2 City Councilor. We're having our ward meeting tonight down at George's Cafe. Uh, we have with us tonight Mayor Carpenter, who will be speaking about the downtown area, a few different homeless uh, issues, uh, walking beats downtown, more, pat more patrols downtown, crime. It's going to cover a lot of to uh, topics. Uh, we have Deb Snow from the Haven here. She's going to talk a little bit about the Haven uh, pr project that's down in Pleasant Street now with the homeless. Uh, Jerry Cassidy, I think um, I think uh, Mike Brady, Senator Mike Brady will be here. Darren Duarte. Uh, anybody else going to speak? Oh, Rob May. Rob May, of course. You're speaking tonight. You didn't know that? Uh, well, we don't have two hours, but anyway. Um, <laughs> <just kidding. laughs> All right. So anyway, um, who do we have here? We have Councilor Lally. Jack Lally, Ward 6, there he is, back there. Big <laughs> I should have applause signs up here, I guess, I don't know. Uh, of course, rep uh, State Rep uh, Jerry Cassidy, right over there. <laughs> of course, Mayor Carpenter, you can give him his big applause. Hey, hey. <laughs> Any other elected officials, did I miss anybody? Oh, Jean Bradley, Devon Court. Councilor Lodge, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mark Lindy, uh, the school committee for Southeastern Regional. Actually, he's the chair, I think, right? Are you the chair? Of that? No, I'm not the chair. No, you're not. Okay, you were the chair, former chair. He has many titles. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, let's start it off with Mayor Carpenter. Uh, come on up, Mayor. Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. Which one am I talking into? That one to the left. Okay, there we go. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I was promised pizza. I hope there's going to be pizza because no, half of us wouldn't have come tonight if there wasn't going to be pizza. There it comes. Open mouth. There we go. Um, so I appreciate Council Monahan uh, running his regular ward meetings. And tonight the council invited me, he asked me to specifically address everyone. Uh, on uh, three issues, uh, issues regarding our chronic homeless population, uh, issues regarding code enforcement in the city, and issues regarding public safety, particularly with an emphasis on the downtown. So um, we will be having, after me, we've got um, Captain Picaro is here from the police department. I'll make some general comments, but I'm going to leave some of the specifics to Captain Picaro. Uh, as Tom mentioned, Darren is here with Captain Picaro with the Brockton Police Department. And uh, I know that the captain will share some specifics with you, but I've also asked him to take comments from you guys and be receptive to observations and suggestions because no one has all the answers, and we certainly want to be in tune with listening to all of the stakeholders in the downtown. So uh, having said that, you guys don't mind if I take my jacket off, do you? Kind of hot outside. <laughs> no. Was that was that the light of the microphone? The microphone still work? No. There we go. There we go. Uh, so, in no particular order, um, uh, let's start with the challenges that the city faces with the chronic homeless population. Uh, I just came back from U.S. Conference of Mayors a couple weekends ago. There is not an American city that does not face challenges with the chronic homeless population. I think what is a little unique to Brockton's situation, and I've said this before, I think we're bearing a disproportionate amount of the burden for southeastern Massachusetts because we're the only city in the metro south area and in a region where you know, here in the city we have three hospitals, we have two courthouses, we have two methadone clinics, we have a variety of social service agencies that are all based here in Brockton and serve the entire Metro South. And so whether we look at some statistics that are collected um, when surveys have done of chronic homeless folks here in the city, or um, even looking at some of our champion plan statistics and doing data research on homeless folks that come through the champion plan, approximately half of Brockton's chronic homeless population were not living in Brockton at the time they became homeless. 
and they may have gravitated here for a number of reasons, but folks who are struggling are going to tend to gravitate towards the facilities and organizations and social service agencies that we have here in the city, and that's just the reality. Um, in terms of the downtown, the chronic homeless population present a number of challenges. Um, the perception of Brockton and the perception of the downtown is certainly negatively impacted when people drive through the downtown and observe folks uh, loitering in public that appear to be homeless and appear to have nowhere to go. It's been a challenge for decades. It's not new. Um, but, you know, what we're trying to overcome is people rolling up their windows and locking the doors and converting them into people that actually park the car, unlock the doors, get out, and spend some money. So there is an impact on the downtown business community and business district from the image and the perception uh, that's created uh, when we have a chronic homeless population downtown. The solutions, you know, are not easy. They're complex. But I think that what we have committed to um, is to working to find solutions to help people transition out of chronic homelessness. The Champion Plan is a big part of that. About half the people coming through the Champion Plan describe themselves as having been homeless on the night before they entered the plan. Um, so there's no question that we've got a big overlap between the opioid crisis and the chronic homeless population along with a whole range of, of, of other issues. But I think something that the city historically lacked is being willing to go forward with initiatives to rather than just complain about the impacts uh, is to actually be willing to go forward with initiatives that can help reduce the amount of the, the uh, chronic homeless population. So the types of things we're talking about is you know, creating transitional housing with wraparound services, permanent housing for people transitioning out of homelessness uh, with wraparound services on site. Quincy, as an example, has done a great job with this. I've visited three different, um, three different uh, houses, for lack of a better word, group homes uh, or, short, or single occupancy housing in Quincy that are exceptionally well run. People are staying there long term. They're having no impact on their surrounding neighborhood. The neighbors think of them as being good neighbors. It can be done. It takes a commitment to do it. Um, but the, the model is there. And ironically, all of these properties in Quincy that I visited were owned by neighbor works with services provided by Father Bills, two organizations that are right here in downtown Brockton. So it's not that we don't have the organizations here that can make it happen. So we've applied for some funding for a pilot project to try to do one property to show everybody how it can work and, and that it won't have the impacts people are afraid of. We've got to get folks off the street if we're going to complain about the impact of having them on the street. Um, to that same direction, uh, Deb Snow is going to talk to you tonight a little bit about the Haven, which is uh, actually operated by a nonprofit of which Deb is the president. And what they're doing downtown now is they're providing a daytime resource center. Right now, what happens at the Father Bill shelter in the morning is everybody gets kicked out at 7 in the morning, and they've got no place to go. And so they're not going to travel too far, and they're hanging around the downtown. Um, what we're trying to do with the Haven, and Deb will do a much better job than this than I, but to provide a multi-service center, not a flop house, not a drop-in center, but a place where people can connect with services a place where people can get counseling on mental health issues, on addiction issues, on uh, vocational training and job training, special outreach to veterans, and a whole wealth of programs that they're running there. Unfortunately, only two days a week right now because that's all the funding they have. They're, the, the funding is an issue. But that model of a multi-service center is working in other cities around the country with the idea of being able to engage positively with folks that are struggling with homelessness, build trust and relationships, and be able to use that trust and relationships to help motivate people to go towards the services and counseling that they need 
to get out of the situation that they're in right then. So we'll let Deb tell you more about that. And clearly, and something we've been working on for a while now, uh, is we need to get you know, the emergency shelter out of the downtown business district. And that's not something I'm saying for the first time. Um, the Father Bill's emergency shelter, it's a noble mission, but where it's situated in the north end of the downtown business district and with the impacts that come around it is a big obstacle to our economic redevelopment efforts in the downtown. And so I think the good news is you know, we have on, we're having ongoing discussions with Father Bills right now uh, that are very positive because here's the reality. We need Father Bills to go to a location that's more suitable for the city. I want to support the services. I want to help people. I want us to be a compassionate city. But we just need to get them to a, a location that has less negative impact on the city. But at the same time, Father Bills desperately has a need for a better facility. Their facility is lousy too, besides the location. And again, this model of a, a multi-service center that includes some emergency overnight shelter is a model that's, that's working in a number of cities across the country. So I can't go too far into specifics because there's no final plan now other than to assure you that with a couple of other partners, we are actively working with Father Bills to try to acquire a, a site that would be more suitable for the city, where it would have less impact, but where Father Bills could then have a far superior facility and be in a position to do a better job serving the people it serves. So we're committed to that. It's sensitive, but it, th those discussions and negotiations are ongoing right now. And with the help of a couple of partners, we are actively helping them to seek another location. And I think it can be a win-win all around. That I think that we can do a better job of helping Father Bills and other agencies compassionately help people while minimizing the negative impact on the downtown business district. So that's homelessness. Um, code enforcement. Code enforcement is a buzz phrase that I think means different things to different people. Um, I think code enforcement is often confused with licensing enforcement and some of the common complaints that I hear people bring to me when they're talking about um, code enforcement, they're really talking about licensing enforcement. Um, but there's no question that um, quality of life issues are a top priority of ours. About, I forget exactly how long ago, Last fall sometime, we established a quality of life task force. We meet every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. It's not a public meeting, but if you'd like to attend sometime, let me know. I'll invite you to come to a meeting. Um, what we do is we sit at a big table, and I have every city agency, along with a couple of outside agencies, that any way has an impact on quality of life issues all sitting at the same table together once a week. Um, agencies such as uh, police, fire, uh, building department, DPW, Board of Health, um, Redevelopment Authority, Law Office. Uh, I'm trying to picture as I look around the room, I'm missing a couple of others. But any city department or agency that in any way impacts quality of life issues we're all at the same table together every Thursday morning. I direct it um, because I think one of the challenges in the past with this is you've got all these, in our model here in Brockton, quote unquote code enforcement is split up amongst a whole bunch of different city agencies who for years have all worked independently of each other and not always done a great job communicating with each other. Um, I think historically they've sometimes debated over turf. You know, the Board of Health says that's the fire department. The fire department says that's the building department. And meanwhile, nothing gets done. Well, if we're all sitting at the same table and I'm directing it and everyone in the room has one thing in common, they all work for me. So we come to a resolution as to who's going to address what, and it gets done that week. We look at both issues that affect neighborhoods citywide such as 
junk unregistered cars as an example. That's a common issue that plagues many neighborhoods in the city. Um, but the majority of our time is spent addressing specific problem properties that have been brought to our attention, most commonly by um, constituents who make us aware. Vacant, abandoned properties are very common, but those aren't the only ones. There are certainly occupied properties that, that cause negative impacts in the neighborhood, too. Everything from uh, noise to overgrown grass to building violations, code violations. But what happens is, is when a property comes to our attention, and I encourage everyone to use C-Click Fix, because every single quality of life issue that comes in on C-Click Fix is either resolved by the next Thursday or it's on the agenda for the next Thursday's quality of life meeting. Um, so we need the help of the residents with the eyes and ears of bringing problem properties to our attention. Once we get them there to a Thursday morning with everyone working together, um, we are getting the properties addressed and addressed pretty quickly. The, um, on some properties that it becomes, the other source often of these properties also besides constituents is agencies that participate in this meeting every week. So one of the things we do is I ask agencies at any problem properties that have come to their attention during the past week to share those properties uh, with everyone in the room because it's not uncommon when a property has one type of code violation, it usually has others. People don't usually have impeccably main properties that have one single issue. If a property's got issues, it usually has multiple issues, anything from uh, you know, illegal apartments to drug dealing to, to every negative impact a property can have on a neighborhood. But that property, once it gets in front of us on a Thursday morning, gets a lot of attention. Uh, it's not unusual in any given week for us to have one or two properties that we immediately send multiple agencies out to see together. Um, the, um, we're getting most of the properties resolved uh, in a fairly short amount of time. Some are more complex that require longer-term solutions, including, you know, sometimes having to bring property owners to court, and that's why the law office is there. Sometimes using uh, unpaid property taxes in, in the land court as a lever against a property owner. And, and one interesting one is the police, and they usually have two or three different representatives at our meetings, is that as standard practice now, any property that they raid successfully, guns, drugs, a raid where they go in and either execute a warrant uh, or confiscate materials and make arrests, they bring those addresses to us. A large majority of those addresses are multifamily properties. They're immediately referred to the Board of Health, who immediately starts looking at that property and determining do they have the correct certificates of fitness? Are they all current? What additional pressure can we bring to bear on the owner of a property who is allowing illegal activity to go on and to be a blight on the neighborhood that they're in? And uh, that also has had uh, some positive impact in some neighborhoods. Um, so please bring those properties to our attention. If you bring them to our attention, they will get a response. Uh, we're getting to the ones we know about, but we know there are a lot more that we don't know about. And finally, on the code enforcement note, there's been, we have typically uh, at our quality of life meetings, we have uh, <clears throat> a police representative from the Detective Bureau, a police representative from Community Policing, along with Sergeant Schleeman, who is the police liaison to the Board of Health. So there are typically three different sections of, of uh, the police department represented at these meetings. Um, a topic of much discussion over the last three or four years has been the desire of many, including many members of the city council, um, to have a police officer assigned full-time to exclusive duties of code enforcement. The challenge has been we are undermanned on the street, and we are, we've been putting our efforts into beefing up the patrol force. Um, but right now, yesterday, 
uh, we had a class of 12 new officers hit the street for their field training. After two weeks in the classroom and six months in the academy, they're now out with training officers for the next two to three months. Three more will be joining them uh, in July. Uh, we couldn't get all 15 into one academy. Three had to go to a separate academy. Um, but when those officers uh, are ready to hit the streets on their own, probably in September, um, the chief and I are committed at that point to the chief posting and assigning a full-time police officer to code enforcement again. Um, with the extra 15 officers hitting the patrol force for the first time in quite some time, we'll be in a position that we'll be able to get by with one less patrol officer or patrol supervisor uh, in order to have someone full-time dedicated to all code enforcement activities, which will include working closely with other agencies, because there aren't that many codes that the police department is usually the primary in, in enforcement on, but they're very effective assisting other agencies as well. So there's a lot of progress on code enforcement, but we need your help, and there is a commitment for a full-time police officer assigned to code enforcement in September. Um, so segueing into public safety, and particularly uh, in the downtown, uh, I'm going to try to defer specifics <coughs> to Captain Picaro, uh, but, you know, there's no greater priority to a city, whether it's the council or the mayor, uh, than the safety of the residents of the city. And uh, we've certainly faced our challenges over the years. We are committed to doing whatever we can with the resources we have to continue to increase our commitment so that people feel safe in their neighborhood, regardless of what neighborhood that is, anywhere in the city. Um, I'm very, and I know I've got several counselors here, Duran and Court, Rodriguez, Lally, Monaghan. Um, I, I want to express publicly uh, that we appreciate the council supporting the police overtime budget this year as submitted because that funding is crucial to the police department's ability to address the issues that folks here in this room want to see addressed. And uh, I, we truly appreciate the support of the council in being willing to partner with us in this because the reality is that minimum staffing requires overtime. Uh, Long-term investigations by detectives requires overtime. The drug dealers don't punch in at 4 and punch out at 12. You know, these investigations to get search warrants often take, se commonly, take several months, expending a lot of resources until uh, they have enough that a judge is willing to issue a warrant to go through someone's door without their permission. And that's an investment we've been making. We've more than doubled the number of annual drug raids uh, since the time that I originally became mayor. We've gone from less than 40 a year to 80 a year. Um, but they are expensive. They're a big commitment of time and resources. And we've also been able to do that by really emphasizing cooperative partnerships with other law enforcement agencies. We're pooling resources and intelligence every day <clears throat> with state police, federal law enforcement agencies, county law enforcement, surrounding towns. We do a lot of work with Boston cooperatively as an example, sharing intelligence, sharing resources. And that also <clears throat> allows us to conduct more investigations when we're not providing all of the resources for that investigation. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the downtown, uh, there have been a couple recent developments Captain Picaro can fill you in on. Uh, there have been some foot patrols added at the north end of the downtown. The Housing Authority has committed to funding some uh, additional patrols uh, at their expense uh, in a neighborhood where they own multiple properties. And we're looking at right now beefing up foot patrols, bicycle patrols, motorcycle patrols. Uh, just yesterday, um, the chief posted under the union contract uh, for bids for additional uh, officers to become certified as bicycle officers. Some of these moves that we're taking this week, we had to wait for the final approval of the budget. We had to know what we were going to have to work with for funds so that we could prioritize where that money would be spent. Uh, along those lines, going back, a, a quick final note on code enforcement, 
the Board of Health has a vacant outside code enforcement position right now that will be posted in the next day or two to be filled. When we get close to the end of the fiscal year, we're not sure how the next budget's going to go. We often don't fill positions in May or June until we know what the July 1st budget's going to look like. Um, but that outside code enforcement position at the Board of Health will be filled as soon as possible because the funding is there for it in the budget, and we thank the Council for the support on that also. So having said that, um, I think I'd like to uh, I'm going to defer the questions and get these guys up there and let them handle the questions. But I'd like to ask Darren Duarte to come up for a minute. He's our new Director of Communications and Community Outreach. You'll see him at these meetings uh, all the time. But I'd like to give him a chance to say hello and then have him uh, introduce Captain Picaro of the Police Department, who is here to both uh, update you on a few things, but even more importantly, uh, listen to your comments and feedback. Okay? So thank you. Try not to kick you out there, Dan. Thank you, Mayor. Hello, folks. Hello. Um, this has been uh, a challenge, but I think also it's an exciting time for our city. Uh, and there are a few reasons for that. One is the hope now is that we're going to be bringing police brass not only to these meetings, but to your neighborhood to engage in dialogue so that not only can we hear from you, the police hear from you, but you'll know what's happening with them and you can talk about your concerns as well. I think when people know each other and get a fear for what's happening, they'll understand and respect one another a lot better. Also, anyone who steps out of Brockton and watches the Boston News knows what happens a lot of times. You don't see an officer when there's a major story on the, Bro on the Boston News talking about it. We're starting to change that. We think that when a major st crime happens or something happens in the city, the police are doing a great job, but we want to show that we're in control <laughs> by just making a statement here and there. It's, those are just some of the things that's going to be happening in the next few weeks and throughout, but I wanted to let you guys know that, that uh, we'll be doing these neighborhood meetings. And my door is also always open for anybody who wants to come in, give me a call and so forth, and talk about whatever issues they have in their neighborhood or with their business and so forth, what's going on, whether it's downtown or whether it's in whatever, whatever part of the city it may be in, um, going to the churches to talk with people. But again, you know, police, they do have a tough job. Uh, they manage crime. But consequently, as a result, they manage the image of the city through that crime. And our goal is to begin to change that by getting out front and showing that the police are in control. They solve a lot of crimes that some of you are not even aware of. And there's a lot of inaccuracies in reporting, too, that you may not know. A story may go out tonight that someone was shot, and they were not shot. We're going to change that as well. So all these things is going to be a factor in us moving forward uh, with the police and the community and building relationships. And I thank you for your time, and I know a lot of you wanted to hear Captain Picaro talk about some of the initiatives that we have for Councilor Monaghan's ward. So, well, without before further... You, before you sure. go, um, what, ven what venues are you going to be using to get this information out that you just talked about? Uh, neighborhoods, uh, if, if uh, this inaccurate information is going out through... Well, 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 when I say inaccurate information, we've already stopped a lot of that inf inaccurate information. Okay. It hasn't even gone out. So that's, it's mainly not getting out in the first place. So that's, that's, um, that's what's key, because inaccurate information has been getting out in the past, and we stopped that this past week on a number of occasions. You know, gunshots, call, was it gunshots, it's fireworks, so that story doesn't get run. Maybe in the past that may get run, and then corrected later or not corrected at all. So these are the kind of things that we're working on. As far as um, formats, we're going to, Reach out to people uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, by phone, um, by email, and with the help of uh, BCA doing some things as well, and with the help of counselors as well. Also, I think that you know, when a crime happens in a counselor's ward, the counselor should know something about it. So we plan on helping with that as well. All right? Thank you, Dan. Um, so with that, let me bring up Captain Mark Picaro with the Brockton Police.
right, good evening, everybody. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Mark Bacar. I'm a captain with the Brockton Police Department. I'm the department's patrol division commander, and in that assignment, I oversee the department's three patrol shifts. I just want to take one second, one minute of your time, <coughs> to mention something about Darren. He just started working with us last Monday, and Darren works days 8 to 4. I work 4 p.m. to midnight. <laughs> And it seems like almost every day when he should be going home with everyone else who works days, Darren comes down the stairs and comes into my office, sits down, and picks my brain. He's eager to learn as much as he can about our department. Um, I think it was one night last week you stayed until almost 7.15 or 7.30. So uh, it's, it speaks well of him, and I think uh, we can expect good things from Darren. I just wanted to say that, let you know what he's been doing with us so far. And with that, if anyone has any questions or concerns or issues you want to run by me or make me aware of, I'll be more than happy to uh, listen to them. Well, let's start with what's going on for the patrols downtown yeah. in that area where we talk North, um, North Warren Ave and Pleasant, <coughs> the homeless issues and that, what you guys are doing now. Um, what we just started doing, and actually this is, uh, I give the credit to the Brockton Housing Authority. About a week or two ago, the Brockton Housing Authority received a grant. I don't know the source of the funding, but they received some money for police details. And I don't want to say daily, but almost daily, it seems like, they're putting out anywhere from two to four officers to patrol a very focused area of Hereford Street, Spring Street, Walnut Street, Turner Street, Haverhill Street, the 100 and 200 block of North Warren Ave, where they have a lot of their residential properties situated. And our, our, our focus, our goal in that area is to help clean that area up, to saturate that area with four offices, ideally, for the, uh, the, the time frame of the detail and be as proactive and as aggressive as we can. I don't know if anyone lives in that area, but we've been in that area a lot in the last two weeks, courtesy of that detail. We're in marked vehicles, unmarked vehicles. I've worked that detail myself a number of times. Uh, we get out on foot, we walk that area, we interact with the residents, they love seeing us. Uh, you know, just last night I pulled over two cars, wrote two citations, we've written parking tickets, uh, we've addressed quality of life issues, uh, the prostitution, we uh, uncovered some of that on Saturday during the detail, so we've been very busy in that area. Thanks. That's, this is the saturating that area is really something that we, <coughs> as you know, as we started, uh, actually, <coughs> not to get into the campaigning, but <coughs> when we were holding signs over there at North Warren Ave and Pleasant Street last year, the homeless and whoever were out pressing the walk button at the intersection and going car to car stopping traffic just to do that and it was just that entire action of uh, hanging out in those areas so you guys are moving those people along cleaning that area up yeah we're doing our best to do that we do receive a lot of calls regarding people soliciting money from motor vehicles we'll go down there we'll check it out and we'll move these people along if we can certainly and if anybody has an issue in that area they should be calling you guys absolutely yeah that's absolutely essential you have to call us and especially now that you have people down there it's a little quicker. We're, we're right there. Right. Four of us. So anybody in that area, it is on c camera, whatever, it's on cable. If there are issues, you have to call. They're down there now. So if, I, I have problems with Legion Parkway also, where they're hanging out here and there. But now that people know that you guys are in the area, a quick call should take care of that problem. Right. Yes. Good. Mark's right there. Hi, how are you? Good. My name is Mark Lindsay. I'm the general manager of the Brockton Community Access Center on North Main and the right. four North Main uh, intersections. Mm -hmm. um, we've been here since 1994, mm -hmm. and it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Uh, the mayor's tried to help us, Sergeant Linehan. I'm happy that I'll get to deal with Darren because Darren has been a big help in the mayor's office, and I'm looking forward to working with him to promote this on TV. Mm -hmm. But we had a job interview last week, and someone came for the job interview, and there was someone lying on the ground behind my building. 
I didn't know if they were alive or dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, I stopped calling because they don't, they don't outwardly laugh at me, but I don't have any presence. We used to have bike cops. Okay, I'm a we deal with volunteers. They have right. to want to come and work at the building. Guests that want to come on TV. And I had s staff that didn't want to come to work, including me. I used to go there every Saturday morning for a couple hours, nice quiet time for paperwork. And I had people drying their clothes on our, 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 our back line. If we did not have the Brockton Parking Authority using our lot in a partnership, we'd be the needle capital of downtown, okay? We have people living down there. The church and I, we try to work together to keep people out of the area. And I don't, I'm not heartless. My, da not my, my dad ran, ran Main Spring House for 18 months when he retired from being the director of parole for the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get him home because he was staying with the kids and the mothers. When Main Spring became Father Bill's, it's a different place. <coughs> Okay, the mayor pointed out that 50% of the people there are from Brockton. Okay, it's not the same. It's not the same hometown mainspring house that we had here before. And it's bad. I mean, the day, this goes back two or three administrations ago. There was a lady volunteering at the soup kitchen at the church. Guy came around the corner with a gun, shot her dead. Um, I've talked to the counselor a lot. He's tried to help in any way that he can. The mayor's tried to help in any way he can. All I'm asking is one simple thing. It doesn't cost a dime. Mm -hmm. Drive through my parking lot anytime you want to. If you're coming up Court Street, drive through and go out the other side. It doesn't cost anything. We can be a police substation. We have cameras. The mayor helped us put cameras in and there are cameras on that corner. It is just awful and we don't feel safe. The only thing I'm going to say is the person that you did not know if they were alive or dead, you have to call us, Mark. I, I know. Oh, I okay. I thought you said you stopped calling. No, I, I call them now. Okay. Yeah, but it's absolutely I, I have important. To power wash the building. Yeah. People use it as a bathroom. It's just awful. Yeah, the, I just got that, that area is very challenging, not only to the businesses, but to us. And we've, we've commented amongst ourselves, it seems like. Even from last year, the population of people out and about this year seems to have, I, 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 I don't know, my own perception, it seems like it's doubled. Yeah. Whether it has, I don't know, but it just seems like there are people everywhere. Now, we have other towns dropping off their homeless. <coughs> we have High Point taking their people when they're done with uh, treatment, and they drive them and drop them off at Perkins Park which that has to be addressed. They are, people are using us as this homeless center for South Shore, Southeast of Massachusetts, and everywhere you turn. And other cities and towns, they come in, as, and we try to get them to stop it, but they come in, feed, come down, drop off food, they'll just leave it at Perkins Park and leave it there, wind's blowing trash all over the place. So there's a lot of issues, and other towns want to keep the homeless out of their towns. So some of them might come and say, well, we're a church coming down to help out with this, with that. But as far as I'm concerned, these richer towns are just trying to keep them here. That's, that's what I'm getting. And as we already are the social service capital of Massachusetts right now, we have everything coming into the city. So it's really, really tough on, uh, on the police department, on the fire department. We've said numerous times we've had, I don't know how many calls go to the neighborhood health center, how many calls are going to... Uh, a mainspring a year, costing us hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's for the fire department that goes for one call, it's like a thousand dollars. So we've got a lot of issues. The state has to help out. Everybody has to get in here. These surrounding towns need to be stopped. We should start taking them or whoever there's an issue and bring it to another town because that's that, that's what they're doing to us. So it makes it his job, the police department job, that much harder when all these other entities are, seem to be against us. I just, I'm going to stand over here. Um, I'm Lynn Smith. I work for Old Colony Elder <coughs> Services. Our headquarters is at 144 Main Street. We employ over 200 people. We have a $40 million a year annual budget. And unlike a lot of nonprofits, we have an LLC that owns our building. So we pay $60,000 a year in real estate to the city. 
real estate tax, and we pay $80,000 a year for our parking permits in the city. Our employees now are so nervous about working downtown because of incidents that have happened, and we are keeping a log that our senior level people have just issued us personal alarms so that if we're in a situation that we feel uncomfortable, we can pull a pin and an alarm goes off. We had a woman going to lunch to the Peruvian place mm -hmm. in between our building and the DA's office, and she was attacked from behind, eight months pregnant with twins. The only thing that saved her was somebody leaned on a horn and startled the man. I volunteer in the Douglas Community Garden. I'm downtown every day, 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock. I probably am down there more than some of your patrol officers. They're great when I call, don't get me wrong, but I've lost all my volunteers, Captain. They won't come downtown anymore. They're tired of cleaning up human excrement. They're tired of going into the rain barrel to water the flowers and they can't use it because someone puked in it. They're tired of being chased by people who are aggressive and nasty to them. There's a difference between homeless and lawless. And we're dealing with lawless. We're dealing with open containers of alcohol. We're dealing with people who are not um, right in their mind. You know, they're high on drugs. Or, you know, they, they shouldn't be on the street. And your offices, I hear the frustration in their voice because they know when they come to the garden and they move a group of eight or ten people away, they just go to another place. Look at the fence now that's going up on Legion Parkway. There's a parking lot that's a big hang out there. There's a fence going up now to keep the people out of that parking lot. Where are those gonna, people going to go? They're going to be following me to the garage at 4 o'clock at night when it's late, or they're going to be waiting for me in the garden when I try to you know, do some work to make Brockton better. You've got to help us. You've got to help the businesses that want to hang in there. The first rule of any business is it costs you a hell of a lot more to get a new customer than to keep the customers that you have. You've got to work to keep the customers that you have. People like Mark, people like myself, we have hung in there in Brockton for a long time, but it's getting too dangerous now. We can't do it. When you have to issue personal alarms to your people, it's not right, Captain. It's not right. So please help us. Please help us be safe yeah. in our own community. Thanks. I, I understand what you're saying, and I can sympathize. It's my hope with the, the, the chief putting out, you know, soliciting officers to hopefully get on the bicycles, the pedal bikes, in addition to the motorcycles. That, to me, would go a long way and have them focus on downtown. But we've got to take it in steps. We've got to see who wants to volunteer for this unit, then send them to training, and then get them out there. But you got to understand, <clears throat> right now, it's, I mean, you just all see it, it's a very overwhelming problem, and we have very limited resources. You know, we do our best, but we, it, it's unfortunate. We, sometimes we're just chasing call after call after call after call, and you hit the nail on the head. We move them from this corner, so they go to that corner. Someone calls. We move them from that corner, they go to that corner, someone calls. Then we move them here. The, it's like a shuffle game. You know, and it's unfortunate, but it's just it's just how it is right now, unfortunately. But um, I hear you, and I can tell your frustration, and we'll do our best for you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Captain, this is Cindy ATR Crossover. I live at 50 Center Street. Brand new, beautiful building. Part of phase one of the whole redevelopment of downtown. I've been there this month for three years. Mm -hmm. I've lived in Brooklyn <coughs> my entire life. I'm fifth generation. For the first time in almost 50 years, I'm afraid to live in Brockton. I grew up in Camp Hello on Montello Street Extension. I lived there for 46 years. For circumstances, I had to sell my house, and I, I moved here. It's a great building. Honestly, it is. It's beautiful. I have underground parking. I have two bedrooms, two baths. It's gorgeous. But you know what I say when I look out my window? Captain Alley Way. I've got homeless sleeping in the doorway. My son went over there the other day when it was raining and he used a sprayer with bleach to clean the urine because when you walk by the stench is so bad and he did it while it was raining so it would wash away. I don't know if you know but when bleach hits urine it bubbles, it foams, it's disgusting and it was really disgusting. With my job 
I work mostly afternoons and nights. I drive home. Anywhere I drive home, anywhere between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. I get off 24, I come down Pleasant Street, I take the right usually on Warren Avenue, maybe the left on Green or the left at Legion Parkway. <coughs> you know, stop and gas, you know the issues there, I don't have to tell you. I, when I went to the Safe Streets meeting a couple weeks ago, I told all those police officers in the room, I run red lights. I stop, I look, nothing's coming, and then I proceed to go because of all the people that are loitering. Never. Oh, okay, I won't say never. Maybe once. You know what I've seen? A Brockton police officer. For that area, I see no cruisers. That's, I, I get it. I know Brockton is understaffed, but you know what? I don't want to hear it anymore. It's, it's, I'm tired of hearing we don't have enough cops. Counselors, mayor, do something about it. I don't care if all of you have to take a damn pay cut to get more patrols. I, I get it, I really do. My ex-husband worked for the city, you know him. But you know what, if it's that bad and you don't have the manpower to back you up, then you need to do something, you need to give to. You know, we can't keep paying taxes and you know, you, you can't get blood from a stone. Women shouldn't be walking on Main Street and being accosted. I can't take my dog out for a walk. I can't do it. There's condoms outside. There's, there's needles on the sidewalk. You know, if I need to do something, I don't do it downtown Brockton. I have to go somewhere else. And that's really too bad that I can't walk from my building to Alvarez for a sandwich. I can't use the bank that's in my neighborhood because I'm not going to be safe walking to Harbor One. This is serious, serious quality of life. And, Mayor, if you want people like me living in downtown Brockton, Make it safe for me. If you want people like Lynn and, and Jeannie and all these other people working in downtown Brockton, it has to stop now. No more of this being politically correct. We can't please everyone. If these other towns and communities are dumping their problems on us, put them on a bus and send them back. Put them in a cab and send them back. This just cannot continue. And say we'll do our best for you. And that's what we keep hearing. We keep hearing we're doing our best, but you know what? I need more people. That's yeah, the but you know line. what? And, and I know we've got DEA and state and FBI. I know all these agencies are in the city, but it's not enough. And you know what? I don't know the answers because I know there's not enough money to keep throwing at the problem, but enough. Our city councilors, you just got to get it done. You can't stop, uh, keep continuing to say, well, let's do this. Let's do another study. Forget the damn studies. You know what needs to be done. You don't need to be putting money into more studies that are sitting on shelves. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I brought up at the last meeting, you never see a cruiser. Do you see cruisers around? I don't. No. You never see one. It's like they disappeared, and I know cruisers are now SUVs, and you know, but you never see a police cruiser around. They're out there. There's a lot of street miles to be patrolled in this city. Oh, so I know just that. because you may not see one, they're out there and they're working. But do you ever think of taking the blank ones and putting places maybe they think they're around? That would be a drain on manpower to have to, to do that. I'll go drive one down by you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. One thing I will say is that um, I wouldn't say that our homeless population has dramatically increased over the past few years. What has, ha what has happened is we've had an increase in visibility in the homeless population. Mm -hmm. And I tie a lot of that directly mm -hmm. to the uh, raising of the area down by Elliott Street, which was formerly known as Tent City. A lot of those people stayed there, they stayed out of their way, especially the ones that were more problematic, the ones that were more were less social. Uh, they would stay in that area and they would avoid people as much as possible. When the tent city development was wiped out, 
it forced them into the streets. It forced them into visibility. And these are the people that most people associate with having the mental issues, with having the antisocial issues. So they were driven out of an area that they were in and forced into a more public uh, venue. Um, whether that, you know, is either here or there as far as you're concerned, that's, um, you know, that's just the reality of it. Uh, as far as other towns dumping their home was here, uh, kind, of, kind of speak to that from experience, and I'm sure that uh, people here from the Haven can agree with me on this too. Uh, funding for places like Father Bill's and Mainspring and other emergency shelters are actually uh, set up on what they call catchment areas. In other words, in order to receive maximum funding, they have to serve, you know, to serve a certain number of communities. Um, in order for Father Bill's and Mainspring to get the funding they get, they have certain towns that surround them that they have to be open to taking in people from those areas. So if they're not open to doing that, their funding decreases, the services they can provide decrease, and that puts even more of a strain on public safety. So uh, just something to think about. Um, and here's my question. I'm going to put it out there. It's something that I've thought of for, for years. I understand that there's a, a heavy demand for overtime for the police budget and that there are operations that need to take place, like you mentioned earlier, detectives, drug raids, things like that, that those are important and they do need to definitely go on. But here's my question. How long are we going to continue to try to catch more fish with the same size net? When are we going to be able to find a balance between overtime and hiring and staffing so that we can eventually have an increase in the money that's going to new officers that are actually able to help combat the problem and a reduction in overtime because we don't have the staff to do the job that we need done? There's got to be a way to find a balance. Is there some way that maybe the, you know, the police supervisors union or the police union or whoever, the patrolman's organizations or whatever, could sit down with the mayor of this, uh, this CFO and say, look, here's what we need. We need to allocate a certain amount of money towards new officers while being able to maintain <coughs> a certain level of overtime until we can transition these new officers in. There has to be a break point where we stop just throwing more money at the same bodies and start increasing the number of bodies and boots on the street. I mean, yeah, eventually I you're... New, new officers, absolutely. Oh, exactly, and I understand the struggle there, but the bottom line is, like I said before, we've got to find a balance. I mean, the taxpayers are already, you know, here we are looking at another 2.5% override. You know, look at another 2.5 this year, full maximum funding that we can do. And, you know, coming up with about a budget which is actually a little bit better than what we've seen in the past couple of years as far as outrageous spending from what I've seen. But... We have to get to a point, and I don't care how it happens, but it's, we can't keep breaking the backs of the taxpayers and have them afraid to walk out their darn doors. We can't. I mean, I live in an area not far from the area you were discussing, down near Walnut, Terrible Haver Hill. I live off of Prospect Street, okay, right there at the corner of North Warren. Okay, now my neighborhood, thankfully, is a dead-end road that butts up behind a school, so I don't have a lot of problems there. But when I want to go to work, guess where my bus stop is? Right there next to Tanner Hill. Think I don't see some crazy stuff waiting for the bus? And like, you know, the young lady here said, you know, this young lady here said, you know, the one thing I don't see is cruisers. And I, I know how to spot an unmarked, so I'm not even seeing those out there. I have yet to see the foot patrols you're talking about. We need to be able to look to realize that when we negotiate these budgets and we negotiate these contracts with our public safety officials, the last thing we want to do is see you guys take a cut. Because you work hard for what you earn. But another thing that concerns me is that when I look at these officers, and I see a lot of them, I work in a retail environment, they come in my store all the time. I talk to them on a daily basis, I pray for them every night. I see the fatigue. I see the hypervigilance. I see that these guys are being stretched to the limit. It's making them wary. It's making them nervous. It's making their families nervous. It's putting them under a lot of stress that they shouldn't have to be under because they're not sure if at the end of their 8 or 12 hours they're going to be able to pack up and go home or if we're going to have to work 3 or 4 more 5 hours to cover because we don't have enough boots on the street. And that creates dangerous conditions not only for the people of the city but for the officers as well. 
A hypervigilant officer is a dangerous officer. You know it and I know it. The more nervous they are, the more overtired they are, the more slow they are to react, the more they try to compensate by being a little bit more aware and a little bit more paranoid, and that can put them at risk. Well, if we were to see an officer like that at work, we would certainly address it. I would hope so. In my 17 years, I've never seen anyone like that. Right. Do it. I, would, I would hope so. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, the fact that they even have to be put in a position where they might wind up in that situation, the fact that they have to not know whether at any given time they're going to be called on to work another four to six hours just because there's not another, another set of boots to put in their place concerns me. And there's got to be a way that we can find a happy medium to put these boots on the street, you know, by reducing some of the overtime so that eventually we can reduce the overtime even further because we no longer have the need for overworking these officers. Got to find a way. Got to find a way. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, I'm not a member of um, Tom's ward, but I do have a question for Darren. Darren, I see you here taking notes um, in your new role. So are you a part of the Quality of Life Task Force? And if you are, what are you going to bring to those Thursday meetings? For example, when you said that uh, you've stopped and you're problem solving, you've stopped a number of uh, reports, inaccurate reports. What else, or are you a part of the problem solving of what you hear coming out from these residents? What are you going to bring on Thursday morning, if you are there, to that task force? Well, well we just started. I've been to one quality of life meeting as the community outreach communications person for the Brockton police. But I've been to those quality of life meetings uh, every week when I was in the mayor's office. Oh. Uh, so I see what happens. We, we organize the staff, the city staff, to tackle those problems. But more than that, regarding the community outreach and communications uh, person within the Brockton Police Department, it's about not just those quality of life issues, it's about keeping a dialogue open with the people of this city. This is your city. This is your town. Yes, if, if events like this should happen in other neighborhoods too, not just in the ward meetings, hear from the police, we hear from you. We, the hope is, and what we expect to do, is that we go back and work with what we have and to make changes. And for instance, Cindy, you were talking about something. Uh, like I'd, I'd ask you, the times of day, well, that's good. Uh, will, you, will you see those things happening? The time of day, you see that pressure the other way? What are the good times? for the police to be there. I'll talk to people like this and put that into the lexicon so that guess what? During this period of time, if we can, we'll be there at those times when it's heavy for you know, what you described that was happening outside your window. Those are the kinds of things that we're we'll gonna be doing working with the community. Those are the kind of things that um, we're gonna be answering and I'm gonna be talking to people about as well and working with the chief and uh, other members of the Brockton Police Department. Thank you. All right. else? As far as the bike patrols and the motorcycles, now I understand what they're talking about because I know it's most of, well, that's on my wall, it's across the street. But, so, you just said you just started saturating that area up we were talking about. How about the whole down, or that area of the downtown Legion Park where you stop mm -hmm. and go, uh, the uh, Trinity Fraud, Moxburg building, is that where we're going to, how much saturation, I mean, obviously, to try to get the problem solved, we're going to really double the effort in that area. I don't know if, if we can do that, if it's a possibility to do that, but I think, and I, what the residents, what, what the residents, whatever, what everybody's saying here is that, and, and Darren too, now you're hearing this, this problem, we're seeing it getting worse, so we're really, you guys are going to have to go back and say, hey, we've already upped it but we're going to have to do more to get that done. I mean, that thinks, that's the only way, because it's getting to a point, and I understand it, when if you have to go to work, and you before you walk through that door of the building, there's a <coughs> mess on the ground in front of you, and it's not from a dog. Um, you know, that stuff in the downtown really has to be addressed right now. So hopefully you guys can do a little, I know, like I said, you're really ratcheting it up now, and you got the, 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 uh, the housing authority giving us some patrols, paying for some patrols, so I think maybe we really have to really go balls to the walls more or less and really work on it as, as much as we can until we get that cleaned up. 
I mean, that's that's all we can do because I understand where you have people that are afraid now uh, to go downtown to, to just come out of their apartment building, and that's not right. So hopefully we can get that. I know the mayor wants to bring in more police. We're going to have four more police officers. On top of that, we got when when are they coming out of the academy? I believe 15? the other three, the twelve just hit the road, but they're in the training phase for a few months. Three more graduate the Plymouth Academy, I believe, in July. I don't know when okay. in July, so it's soon. Right. So, I mean, you guys are here. You've heard what the problem is. You hear what the concerns are. Now just go back with the mayor and, and, and come up. You've got a plan for now, but we're going to have to see. Like, they're really worried about when you when you go out. Obviously, there's probably been a cruiser that went, went by. You never, maybe you didn't see one or whatever, but we might have to do something a little more. So, anyway, that's the concerns. I think everybody know everybody. If it's on cable, any of the issues uh, that we're having, we really have to concentrate on downtown. And the big thing is, if we're going to bring the businesses downtown, we can't have that. And bringing the businesses downtown is going to bring in commercial with more tax dollars and everything else. So it all sort of is intertwined. So anyway, we have a question down the end. Deb. decided to start fighting. So they were walking in between all the traffic, fighting, punching each other, and it was total mayhem down there. This was at 8.30 at night, so it shouldn't be happening. There was a police cruiser at a different, at the church, right there, the Greek church, the old Greek church. People that lived here long know the Greek church. He was there attending to a problem. So there was no one else on the beat at the time. It's a major problem in that area. Day, night, weekends, this is not something you haven't just heard. So that, that if you location. can do something in that area. Yeah, we're, we're in and out of that gas station quite a bit, making arrests, moving them along. That gas station is not doing anything as a public service. They don't move people along. That whole problem could have been dealt with by a manager or owner saying, let's go, move it along. My comments. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I'm going to say something positive because I've been living here for a long time, and any time I've called the police, I've always gotten courteous, right to the point, right to my house. I need to listen to. I don't think people realize how many violent calls do you get? How many car accidents do you deal with in a weekend? Just a weekend, last weekend, 49. I'm just saying, you have gang, gang bangers. You've got all sorts of these crazy things happening all at once. And it's hard to, you know, deal with that, this stuff that we're talking about on top of the violence in the city. It's like, I feel like I have to give you some positive feedback because you're not going to be able to stop anything from happening. You have to deal with it when it happens. And I don't see you lacking in that area at all. These are just other things you have to deal with as they come. It's, you can't stop, stand in one place and wait for a crime to happen. You have to address it when somebody calls on it. Correct? Yes. So we, I, we try to create a presence in park in certain locations, but like a minute later, they're getting pulled to go to a call. Right. It was last week, Darren, one of his late nights, when he should have been home, he's down in my office, and I showed him on our computer. <coughs> I says, look at this, just so you get a feel for what you're going to be dealing with here. <coughs> in a 12-hour time frame, so it was one of the nights he was with me after 7 o'clock. <coughs> From 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., the computer had tallied up 266 calls. 12 hours, 266 calls. The next night he came down, I says, look at this, Darren. We beat it. It was the next night for the same 12 hours, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., it had jumped to 286 calls on a Monday or a Tuesday. And may I That's ask what we're dealing with. How many patrolmen, how many police officers are on duty? 
to those 200 calls? Six? It varies because it's the 7 a.m. You're catching the last part of the midnight shift, then it goes into the day shift, and then into the 4 to 12. So I, I would have to look at raw. I couldn't tell you offhand how many officers. But, are but it's less than a dozen. Oh, no, it's more than that. For that 12 hour time frame? On duty. On duty, total, it would be more. I, it would be more than a dozen for that 12 hour time frame. Because I was told by one officer who was frustrated that he had about six men to patrol the city when I called. Six. Did that um, break down what types of calls they were? No, it just gives you a raw number in a time. Do you have the ability to um, break that down? The records department can do that. It's a, a bit of an involved process. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> Thank right. you, Captain. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think you guys made your case, so <laughs> uh, it's probably a good uh, good evening for Darren to start going to these meetings and seeing what's going on also. But I think you'll see they are aware of the problem, and like you cannot be everywhere with, with, the, with the amount of police we have to uh, cover everything. And like, like I said, there's a lot of different calls, like Terry's saying. They have a lot of different calls in moving people along, or, uh, this, that, the other. But you do need, you need that presence downtown, and if we're going to bring business back downtown, we're going to need to clean that up. So there are different, different areas. Um, Deb, you want to come on up? That's she's the Haven, president of the Haven. Tell us what's going on down there with the homeless and how you've been helping them out. Thank you for having me come and chat with you for just a couple of minutes about what the Haven is. Um, we opened in November, this past November 2017, after about five years of working out what we wanted to be and how we wanted to be represented in the city. We are a day resource center for the homeless and at risk. That's what, how we're named. It's a place of refuge, it's a place of rest, but it's a place of encouragement. We are located at 74 Pleasant Street, you guys all know where that is. It's right across from the Cope Center, right near Fernandez Liquor Store, a block away from the um, Father Bill's Mainspring, uh, less than a block away from Perkins Park. We are in a prime location to service, to the best of our ability, the needs of the homeless and at risk that are hanging out on Main Street and shooting up behind clothing stores along Pleasant Street. That's where they're going. That's where they hang out. That's where they're comfortable. We opened in that location, number one, it was a gift from God, but it was a gift from the city to be able to access a building that had been empty for 17 years, I understand. The building that we're in is owned by the Brockton Church of God, and it's been empty. We had the opportunity to move in. We're paying a high overhead to be in that location. But to date, just as of this past Monday, we have seen over 557 different people walk in our doors. So when we talk about how the population is, if it's grown, if it hasn't grown, I don't know. They're, we don't track necessarily what town they're from. What we track is when they come in. We track whether or not they had a place to sleep the night before. So 557 people since November. That's a lot of people to be coming in the door saying that they're in need. We are a resource center, which means that we don't ourselves as a board of directors and as a staff provide resources ourselves we connect them to the resources that are already here and available to them in the city. But we make it easier for them to access it. So if they need to go to the DTA and they get handed a page, you know, a 10-page packet of information that they need to fill out and they don't know how to read, what good is it? If they have to go to Social Security and they have to stand online for three hours to then deal with a um, person at the desk who can't, in the time that they need, uh, address the issues that they have, we're trying to bring them into our facility so that they have a little bit more of an intimate opportunity to ask the questions, to have them fill out the paperwork, to get all of these things for housing in place to get them the services that they need. Is it a win-win right now? No. We're not getting all of the resources that we want. Um, it's a win-win in that they come in our doors, they're encouraged, they find it happy, they feel respected, and so they're learning to trust us. Trust is the, is the root. If we can get them to come in and have conversations where we can really understand what their battle is, 
the fact that they don't have a home or they have mental health issues or they have PTSD from being in the service. All of those things take time to kind of weed through and figure out why is it that they're outside? Why are they feeling that heroin is the answer to all their problems? If we don't have a trust relationship, we're not gonna get that information. They're just gonna walk right back out the door. So that's really what we are um, instituted to do, is to love on them to the best of our ability, to give them respect, and to expect respect back. So we have rules, we have expectations. If they break the rules, they're not you know, omitted for life. Every day is a new chance, but there are expectations that come alongside being in with us. Um, so we are encouraged that people are coming in. We have repeaters that c are coming in every single day and staying every single day, all day. If they leave, they'll go over to the soup kitchen and have lunch, and then they'll come back. So we are encouraged that they find it safe to be with us. All of their items are locked up, so they come in. Everybody knows you get a locker. Everything that's on you goes in the locker. We don't inspect your bags. We don't inspect your body. We expect that you will respect our space and you will put your things, if you need a knife for your safety when you're out on the street, have at it, I don't care, it goes in a locker. And they will remind themselves to put it in the locker. So we have, thankfully, um, for our fire and rescue services and our police department, we've had very not even one hand's worth of phone calls to them. Every time that we have called, we've been met with compassion and with respect, not only to us as a staff, but to the members that are coming in. So I applaud our fire and rescue and our police. I, I really do, you guys have been fantastic. You've been, every call that we've needed to make has been answered in less than 10 minutes. And as I said, our members are treated with a high amount of respect and understanding and compassion. So I'm grateful to have them right down the street. Fire station is two doors down from us and they respond quickly and, and we're grateful to have them on our side. Um, we have relationships with, like I said, the services that are already here in the city. So Teen Challenge, there's a whole, we have a whole list of them. We've got um, peer support, we've got overdose prevention education, we've got healthy relationship coaches, we have access to computers, we are um, helping them get quicker access into detox programs. Um, we provide music and art and jewelry making, trying to help them rediscover their God-given gifts. And then again, as we develop a trust relationship, helping them to discover what it is that they want to do for employment so that we can move forward in getting them jobs. That's been, of all of the conversations that I've had with all of the, specifically the gentlemen that come into our building, every single one of them feels um, embarrassed about the fact that they can't provide for themselves and their families. That speaks volumes. They need to be able to believe in themselves and have mentors believe in them to be able to get them jobs, to get them working where they feel like they have an opportunity to care for their families. So I say that out there. I don't know where those jobs will come from. I, don't, I have no idea. But I know that that's what they're not, they're not just asking to work. They're asking to be able to provide for themselves and their families. And that speaks volumes to me. So the places that we have access to, Teen Challenge, the Gandara Center, the Stairway to Recovery, High Point, Brockton Neighborhood Health, Veterans Support, the DTA, Father Bill's Triage Workers, Career Works, all of these facilities, all these resources, you guys already know where they are. We're bringing them into us. We have a mobile dentist that's going to be coming in. We're hoping to have a volunteer who's a nurse who's going to do a little bit of um, light triage so that we don't have to just immediately send people down to neighborhood health to the emergency center. We can kind of weed through what some of their issues are. Um, we've got a lot of diabetics that are coming in and they need to get access to the care that they, that they are requiring. I'm diabetic, I know what I'm looking at. There's a lot of them. So how can we triage them to get them quicker care instead of having them passing out? Everybody thinks they're overdosing, everybody's thinking that they're drunk they're passing out because their blood sugars are over 500, which is deadly. So trying to, again, help sort through some of those issues so that we can resource the, our members out to the correct places. Um, we are volunteer-led. We have a volunteer board of directors. There are eight of us, and we are a working board, which means I'm there every day. I'm doing the shopping, I'm doing the finances, I'm doing all of it. We need volunteers. Volunteers are, during the daytime hours are tough to come by. We're open right now Mondays and Wednesdays from 9 to 4. I would love to be able to open more because the people that you're seeing laying out on the streets, those are the ones that we want to have come in. I need staff. 
We don't have the funding for it. We're trying to write for grants. It's not a very popular thing for places to want to give grants to. It's not a popular population to have out on the streets. So we're between a rock and a hard place as well. We are a nonprofit, 501c3, government recognized, but we are also faith-based, which cuts our ability to get grants from um, government agencies down. So we've been incredibly blessed to have support from the City Hall, um, and we're still alive because of it. He's been great as far as helping us connect with the social service network that's in the city. Um, and you know, we believe, the Haven staff believe, that this is a community effort. We're not gonna be the only ones to get them in the door. Our fire and rescue are gonna be helpful in getting them in the door. You see somebody at the liquor store who's um, inebriated, send them our way, we'll take them. At least we have a safe place for them. They're not sitting out on the street they're not causing trouble because they're inside with us. When they're inside with us, they're not causing trouble. They're doing artwork, they're making jewelry, they're watching movies, they're on the computers, we have a huge library, they're reading, they're reading. So I want to implore that this is not a hopeless population. They're troublesome, for sure. They're not hopeless. As I will say to them, I will say to you, everybody's born with dreams. Everybody has the right to dream. Everybody has the right to, these guys have not chosen this life. Something's broken in their system, in their circumstances, in their life, in their hopes. Something's broken in their mental health that's caused them to be where they are. But just like you and I, they were born with gifts. They just have to figure out how to find them again. That's what we wanna be. But we need, we need help from the government. We need help from the city. We need help from you guys to be an encouragement when you see them, push them our way. 74 Pleasant Street, we're right there. Tell them to come on in, hang out with us. We have a great relationship with Father Bills. We were able to throw a Super Bowl party. Nobody from the police department got called that night. Not one. We released them at 11 o'clock. They all went right back into the shelter. That's a huge thing we take for granted. They had a normal, everyday experience an American experience, and it was very positive. So I say that as an encouragement. I know the population is troublesome. I see it all the time, but there is potential. Just like there's potential in our children, there is potential, and I just want to encourage you to not give up hope because they have gifts, and if we can just direct things in the right way, maybe 1% is, is a win, 1%. We've had 10 people that we've gotten into detox from our facility through the champion plan, through COPE. So that's a positive, that's a win for us. It can be discouraging, but it's a win. I would love the opportunity to be able to stretch and expand our facility to have nap rooms, which everybody gets all freaked out about the idea of a nap room. They walk all night long, they don't sleep. If you're sleep deprived, your behavior is bad, plain and simple. If we can expand our space to get nap rooms that can be safe, where they can crash for a couple of hours and then wake up and be engaged again in a healthy way, that's a positive. So we're working with the church to be able to expand our space. We have downstairs, I just need the staff. If you know anybody who has daytime hours free, it's a safe place. None of our staff have been in any kind of altercation since we opened in November. I would love to be able to open up on Fridays, get a third day in, at least something that, so Monday and Mondays are crazy. Mondays we've seen as many as 120 people in our door all at one time. It's busy. Mondays, there's no place for them to go on Monday. Um, so on average, we're seeing 100, and 100 or so on Mondays and about 75 on Wednesdays. So there's a lot of potential for us to continue to expand on Fridays and basket either side of the weekend to get them in and get them fed and get them healthy and hope to um, work on their mental status before the weekend hits where they, again, they're back out on the street because there's nowhere for them to go. So um, we have received one grant from Eastern Bank. Thank you, Brockton, for that. Um, and again, I just want to leave with you. I I'm happy to take any questions after we're closed for the night, but um, I just, I, I want to encourage you, community, it's about, you know, we've got all of this fire and rescue and we've got business owners and we've got all of the social services agencies in the city. This is a community and this is a community that's got to rally together instead of being divisive. If we can't rally together, then they're just going to stay where they are. If we can come together 
and support each other and be an encouragement and farm them into the right places for them to get the services that they need, we're going to have a better chance of having a win every day. So I thank you again for all of you guys that have been in and seen what we do. I would love anybody who's interested, come on down and just take a walk through. It's a happy place. It's a very happy place. So um, it's 18 and over. Unfortunately, we can't do anything with, um, with children. But as Mayor Carpenter said, um, there are plans to do bigger and better things for this population, and I'm all for it, and I'm encouraged that we might be able to have a wraparound system where all of their needs can be met, families can be dealt with as well as individuals. So, um, so again, I welcome any questions when we're all done for the night. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Yes. And thanks for what you're doing down there. Okay, we got uh, Senator Brady. Come on down. Give us a quick little uh, update on what's going on with funding for our wonderful city, with some school school money, and what have you. What we've got more. Quiet over there. Thank you, Council. And I know Representative Cassidy was here. He had another commitment, but he was here as well. We, we are fortunate. We have a great state delegation working very well together to get funding for Brockton. And it was mentioned earlier, not that funding is the only answer, but Brockton desperately depends on funding from the state and the federal government besides local funding. Because it was mentioned, we don't want to hit everybody with local tax increases in the local community. So we. There's more revenue coming into the state now than was before. Now, the private sector is booming, but there's not enough revenue coming to the state that we liked, even though this past quarter revenue was up. So we were able to increase in the budget funding for our schools and for public safety and for road work that this community has desperately needed. But there was a proposed ballot question on the ballot coming up this November, a fair share amendment, and it would have given more money to uh, communities such as Brockton but the wording, the Supreme Justice Court said the wording wasn't correct because the, when there's a ballot question, they cannot designate where the money is to go. It's up to the legislature. And in the ballot question, the money was designated specifically for schools and for roads, which we know that's where the money is needed. But it's up to the legislature to decide where the money goes. It can't be on a ballot question. So the Supreme Court said that was an unlawful question. Unfortunately, it got thrown off the ballot. But we're looking for other revenue sources. The Airbnbs, which we're not trying to hurt the mom and pa who rents out their cottage, their, their cottage down the Cape for two weeks. We're talking about people that have four or five units that are getting profits from these units that are not paying the fair share of taxes. It's up in Boston as well. The Internet. There's a ton of people buying products over the Internet, but they don't pay their fair share of taxes. And, and it's great that you can get something delivered to your home rather than going to a store to buy something. I'm like an old man. I still go to the store and buy something in person. But a lot of people with young families, they don't have time to get to the store. Like Emma. They have a little bit more of an intimate opportunity to ask the questions, to have them fill out the paperwork, to get all of these things for housing in place to get them the services that they need. Is it a win-win right now? No. We're not getting all of the resources that we want. Um, it's a win-win in that they come in our doors, they're encouraged, they find it happy, they feel respected, and so they're learning to trust us. Trust is the, is the root. If we can get them to come in and have conversations where we can really understand what their battle is, the fact that they don't have a home, or they have mental health issues, or they have PTSD from being in the service, all of those things take time to kind of weed through and figure out why is it that they're outside, why are they feeling that heroin is the answer to all their problems. If we don't have a trust relationship, we're not going to get that information. They're just going to walk right back out the door. So that's really what we are um, instituted to do, is to love on them to the best of our ability, to give them respect, and to expect respect back. So we have rules. We have expectations. If they break the rules, they're not you know, omitted for life. Every day is a new chance, but there are expectations that come alongside being in with us. Um, so we are encouraged that people are coming in. We have repeaters that are coming in every single day and staying every single day, all day. If they leave, they'll go over to the soup kitchen and have lunch, and then they'll come back. So we are encouraged that they find it safe to be with us. All of their items are locked up. 
So they come in, everybody knows, you get a locker. Everything that's on you goes in the locker. We don't inspect your bags, we don't inspect your body. We expect that you will respect our space and you will put your things, if you need a knife for your safety when you're out on the street, have at it, I don't care, it goes in a locker. And they will remind themselves to put it in the locker. So we have, thankfully, um, for our fire and rescue services and our police department, we've had very not even one hand's worth of phone calls to them. Every time that we have called, we've been met with compassion and with respect, not only to us as a staff, but to the members that are coming in. So I applaud our fire and rescue and our police. I, I really do. You guys have been fantastic. You've been, every call that we've needed to make has been answered in less than 10 minutes. And as I said, our members are treated with a high amount of respect and understanding and compassion. So I'm grateful to have them right down the street. Fire station is two doors down from us and they respond quickly and, and we're grateful to have them on our side. Um, we have relationships with, like I said, the services that are already here in the city. So Teen Challenge, there's a whole, we have a whole list of them. We've got um, peer support, we've got overdose prevention education, we've got healthy relationship coaches, we have access to computers, we are um, helping them get quicker access into detox programs. Um, we provide music and art and jewelry making, trying to help them rediscover their God-given gifts and then again as we develop a trust relationship helping them to discover what it is that they want to do for employment so that we can move forward in getting them jobs. That's been of all of the conversations that I've had with all of the specifically the gentlemen that come into our building, every single one of them feels um, embarrassed about the fact that they can't provide for themselves and their families. That speaks volumes. They need to be able to believe in themselves and have mentors believe in them to be able to get them jobs, to get them working where they feel like they have an opportunity to care for their families. So I say that out there, I don't know where those jobs will come from, I don't, I have no idea, but I know that that's what they're, not, they're not just asking to work, they're asking to be able to provide for themselves and their families, and that speaks volumes to me. So the places that we have access to, Teen Challenge, the Gandara Center, the Stairway to Recovery, High Point, Brockton Neighborhood Health, Veterans Support, the DTA, Father Bill's Triage Workers, Career Works, all of these facilities, all these resources, you guys already know where they are, we're bringing them in to us. We have a mobile dentist that's gonna be coming in. We're hoping to have a volunteer who's a nurse, who's gonna do a little bit of um, light triage so that we don't have to just immediately send people down to neighborhood health to the emergency center. We can kind of weed through what some of their issues are. Um, we've got a lot of diabetics that are coming in and they need to get access to the care that they, that they are requiring. I'm diabetic, I know what I'm looking at. There's a lot of them. So how can we triage them to get them quicker care instead of having them passing out. Everybody thinks they're overdosing, everybody's thinking that they're drunk, they're passing out because their blood sugars are over 500, which is deadly. So trying to, again, help sort through some of those issues so that we can resource the, our members out to the correct places. Um, we are volunteer-led. We have a volunteer board of directors. There are eight of us and we are a working board, which means I'm there every day. I'm doing the shopping, I'm doing the finances, I'm doing all of it. We need volunteers. Volunteers are, during the daytime hours are tough to come by. We're open right now Mondays and Wednesdays from nine to four. I would love to be able to open more because the people that you're seeing laying out on the streets, those are the ones that we wanna have come in. I need staff. We don't have the funding for it. We're trying to write for grants. It's not a very popular thing for places to wanna give grants to. It's not a popular population to have out on the streets. So we're between a rock and a hard place as well. We are a nonprofit, 501c3, government recognized, but we are also faith-based, which cuts our ability to get grants from um, government agencies down. So we've been incredibly blessed to have support from the City Hall, um, and we're still alive because of it. He's been great as far as helping us connect with the social service network that's in the city. Um, and you know, we believe, the Haven staff believe, that this is a community effort. We're not gonna be the only ones to get them in the door. Our fire and rescue are gonna be helpful in getting them in the door. You see somebody at the liquor store who's um, inebriated, send them our way, we'll take them. At least we have a safe place for them, they're not sitting out on the street, 
They're not causing trouble because they're inside with us. When they're inside with us, they're not causing trouble. They're doing artwork, they're making jewelry, they're watching movies, they're on the computers, we have a huge library, they're reading, they're reading. So I want to implore that this is not a hopeless population. They're troublesome, for sure. They're not hopeless. As I will say to them, I will say to you, everybody's born with dreams, everybody has the right to dream, everybody has the right to, these guys have not chosen this life, something's broken in their system in their circumstances, in their life, in their hopes. Something's broken in their mental health that's caused them to be where they are. But just like you and I, they were born with gifts. They just have to figure out how to find them again. That's what we want to be. But we need, we need help from the government. We need help from the city. We need help from you guys to be an encouragement when you see them, push them our way. 74 Pleasant Street, we're right there. Tell them to come on in, hang out with us. We have a great relationship with Father Bills. We were able to throw a Super Bowl party. Nobody from the police department got called that night. Not one. We released them at 11 o'clock. They all went right back into the shelter. That's a huge thing we take for granted. They had a normal, everyday experience, an American experience, and it was very positive. So I say that as an encouragement. I know the population is troublesome. I see it all the time, but there is potential just like there's potential in our children, there is potential and I just want to encourage you to not give up hope because they have gifts and if we can just direct things in the right way, maybe 1% is a, is a win, 1%. We've had 10 people that we've gotten into detox from our facility through the Champion Plan, through COPE, so that's a positive, that's a win for us. It can be discouraging but it's a win. I would love the opportunity to be able to stretch and expand our facility to have nap rooms, which everybody gets all freaked out about the idea of a nap room. They walk all night long. They don't sleep. If you're sleep deprived, your behavior is bad, plain and simple. If we can expand our space to get nap rooms that can be safe, where they can crash for a couple of hours and then wake up and be engaged again in a healthy way, that's a positive. So we're working with the church to be able to expand our space. We have downstairs, I just need the staff. If you know anybody who has daytime hours free, it's a safe place. None of our staff have been in any kind of altercation since we opened in November. I would love to be able to open up on Fridays, get a third day in, at least something that, so Monday and Mondays are crazy. Mondays we've seen as many as 120 people in our door all at one time. It's busy. Mondays, there's no place for them to go on Monday. Um, so on average we're seeing 100, and 100 or so on Mondays and about 75 on Wednesdays. So there's a lot of potential for us to continue to expand on Fridays and basket either side of the weekend to get them in and get them fed and get them healthy and hope to um, work on their mental status before the weekend hits where they again they're back out on the street because there's nowhere for them to go. So um, we have received one grant from Eastern Bank. Thank you, Brockton, for that. Um, and again, I just want to leave with you. I, I'm happy to take any questions after we're closed for the night, but um, I just I, I want to encourage you, community. It's about, you know, we've got all of this fire and rescue, and we've got business owners, and we've got all of the social services agencies in the city. This is a community, and this is a community that's got to rally together instead of being divisive. If we can't rally together, then they're just going to stay where they are. If we can come together and support each other and be an encouragement and farm them into the right places for them to get the services that they need, we're going to have a better chance of having a win every day. So I thank you again for all of you guys that have been in and seen what we do. I would love anybody who's interested, come on down and just take a walk through. It's a happy place. It's a very happy place. So um, it's 18 and over. Unfortunately, we can't do anything with, um, with children. but. As Mayor Carpenter said, um, there are plans to do bigger and better things for this population and I'm all for it and I'm encouraged that we might be able to have a wraparound system where all of their needs can be met, families can be dealt with as well as individuals. So, um, so again, I welcome any questions when we're all done for the night. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> yes. And thanks for what you're doing down there. Okay, we got uh, Senator Brady. Come on down. It was a quick little uh, update on what's going on with funding 
for our wonderful city with some school school money and what have you what we've got more quiet over there thank you council and I know representative Cassidy was here he had another commitment but he was here as well we we are fortunate we have a great state delegation working very well together to get funding for Brockton and it was mentioned earlier not that funding is the only answer but Brockton desperately depends on funding from the state and the federal government besides local funding because was mentioned we don't want to hit everybody with local tax increases in the local community so we there's more revenue coming into the state now than was before now the private sector is booming but there's not enough revenue coming to the state that we liked even though this past quarter revenue was up so we were able to increase in the budget funding for our schools and for public safety and for road work that this community is desperately needed but there was a proposed ballot question on the ballot coming up this November a fair share amendment and it would have given more money to uh, communities such as Brockton but the wording the Supreme Justice Court said the wording wasn't correct because the when there's a ballot question they cannot designate where the money is to go it's up to the legislature and in the ballot question the money was designated specifically for schools and for roads which we know that's where the money is needed but it's up to the legislature to decide where the money goes it can't be on a ballot question so the Supreme Court said that was an unlawful question unfortunately got thrown off the ballot but we're looking for other revenue sources the Airbnbs which we're not trying to hurt the mom and pa who rents out their college the, their cottage down the Cape for two weeks we're talking about people that have four or five units that are getting profits from these units that are not paying the fair share of taxes. It's up in Boston as well. The internet, there's a ton of people buying products over the internet, but they don't pay their fair share of taxes. And, and it's great that you can get something delivered to your home rather than going to a store to buy something. I'm like an old man, I still go to the store and buy something in person, but a lot of people with young families, they don't have time to get to the store like Amazon and all those other entities are getting things delivered right to their home but these companies are not located in Massachusetts and their home headquarters is not Massachusetts they're not paying their fair share of taxes they're getting around it so we're looking at rev revenue sources from that and we had a lot of other great ideas for downtown mentioned we had a college collaboration that was supposed to be going in the gambling bu building and I I remember my days I took courses at Northeast University some of the worst areas in Boston Northeast and in Wentworth my buddies would be there with hockey sticks outside their dorms because of the unwanted characters are out there. Well, Northeastern made major investments in Wentworth, and it helped out, the, so it keeps the riffraff out, but it also helped out the small businesses because you got a coffee shop, a dry cleaners, and it helped other businesses invest in the area. And we had a great idea proposed with a college collaboration with the building right next to Joe Angelo's. There was going to be a college collaboration with Bridgewater State, UMass, and Massasoit it would have been huge for downtown. Unfortunately, that got cut from the governor's plans. It's same with Massasoit Community College, the Allied Health Center, where Crystal's used to be. The nursing program alone has a waiting list of over 100 students with perfect grade point averages. In healthcare, there is a ton of needs for jobs and for employees out there, and that was gonna be a huge initiative. And you see the empty parking lot over the east side. That was gonna be an Allied Health Center to train people at Massasoit Community College, which does a tremendous job in our community. Unfortunately, that got put on hold by the administration. I'm not just blaming, blaming the governor because you know, he's worked with us with the open addiction crisis. He's on the same page with us with that. But it's some of the administration that makes decisions at the state level and the governor appoints these things. Now, they come up with another plan to move the unemployment office to the old Ganley building. And that's, you know, that building is in dire shape. They're, they're talking about building a whole new building there. But I just found out today that it's put on hold to not go out to bid till 2019, which is far too long. And, and it's ridiculous. It's been a vacant building for many, many years, and that's an eyesore coming into the gateway of Brockton, besides Pleasant Street was mentioned. Route 123 outside is another gateway into Brockton. And that was another proposal, but think about it this coming election, no matter who you decide to vote for, there's a very important election coming up this, this fall from the U.S. Senate race to the local governor's race, to the state legislators' races. I have an opponent. The rest of the state delegation does not have an opponent. Uh, DA's up for re-election. There's some county seats up for re-election. 
pay close attention. In some of the other towns, if you know people in other communities, there's a, a reps race over in Whitman because that person is running for a different seat. There's a, a reps race out in Hanover. We all need good people in state government to work together. Right now, whether you're a Democrat and public, can most of us work very well together. Vinnie DiMacito abuts some of the areas I represent down in Hanson and Halifax and a lot. He's great to work with. And we've got some money to clean up the Westmont Ponset Pond with cryonic bacteria in those areas down there. In Hanover, we got a veterans facility. It was great for the town of Hanover to honor, to honor our veterans. But predominantly, Brockton is the hub of this whole area, and we need funding for Brockton. And we've had some great initiatives to bring funding to Brockton, and we were able to get more money in the budget. It's in a conference committee right now. There's three members of the House and three members of the Senate who are going to decide what's kept in there. And this is what's happened in the past. We approve the budgets, then whoever the governor is, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, they end up cutting some of the funding. So then we have to do budget overrides to cut the vetoes they do. But then what they can do is they have the power to do nine C cuts later on, which affects the funding for our area. So we end up doing a supplemental budget. But our school system is doing an unbelievable, phenomenal job. But the administration at the school level, at the state level, the Board of Education, support a charter school in Brockton. And by the laws, our test scores are above the state averages. Our teachers and staff in the school system are doing a phenomenal job. We didn't need this charter school in Brockton. We have choices. We have Southeastern Region, which is a great school. We have the Catholic Academy. And we can send kids to other communities. If our school population is, is not fitting the needs of our students, they can go to West Bridgewater or Avon. There's a school choice program. So there's plenty of choices. This charter school has been a $4 million hit to our city of Brockton's budget which is terrible. And how did they get around this? They included the city of Taunton and the town of Randolph, and their test scores are not equal to what Brockton's kids are doing. So that averaged out, brought the test scores down. They came into Brockton. They went down to um, Marion's Tuxedo Building. was not adequate. Then they, they got a work stop out on that. They were busing kids up to another community. Then they finally went into a building down the south side of town, an old Verizon building, Never pulled the building permit, so the building inspector had to put a work stop order there. Uh, they'll take kids for a short window to get their numbers up with students. Then if they feel the kids aren't working in the system, they send them back to the public school system. And we can't deny educating any child. And we do a great job. Kids who have disabilities, we don't turn any child away. And with the resources they have, they're doing a phenomenal job. They're doing a lot better than when I graduated in 1980 and when Tom graduated in the 70s. The, our school system is recognized all across the state. We're sending kids to the top colleges in the Commonwealth, but without the funding, that affects our area. So we've got more money in the budget for the schools. We've got more money for Chapter 70 money, for local aid money, which is good, but it's going through the process. And, and it was mentioned over, no, nobody can do it alone. And then our federal dollars. We get CDBG money for Brockton, Community Development Block Grants. And this person in the White House, every other day he's tweeting a new message we don't even know what he's doing, but it's a very scary time. Every other day he's going to do this, and then he's going to do that. And we have a great congressional delegation, and Steve Lynch is on us. I've been working very hard as a congressman for us, and I know Senator Warren and Senator Markey are doing a great job. They've been here in person. They've listened to us, but we need their support. And uh, I want to thank you. My office is always open. I, I have a couple in my office, uh, Gene Derencourt and Ed Miller, who work for me in the State House, and uh, you know me, I've been here all my life. And a lot of the things that were mentioned earlier, I've been here. I've worked at Superior Bakery nights when this police force was cut down to one cruise on a week a night. You, you think things are bad now. They were a lot worse back then. But the problem is there wasn't the heroin epidemic we have today. And we've funded a lot of things to get people help with opiate addiction crisis. And not everybody chooses to be a heroin addict or an alcoholic addict or whatever addict they due to circumstances, and we've gone after these companies at the federal level with the drug manufacturers because they made billions and billions and billions of dollars off our children. I, I, there's a person who grew up in this neighborhood right now, and he's dead, and he was a great football player in Brockton. He went to the top schools, Iowa State, and through a football injury, he was on pain meds. He later became addicted to heroin. He's no longer with us, and there's many, many other young people that have dealt that. So we passed a criminal justice reform bill that has helped get these addicts help rather than put them into jail when they're not getting any help at all. But we haven't forgotten about the drug deals, though. We increased penalties 
on these drug deals and mixing fentanyl with the heroin that are killing more and more young people. So we've gone after them too. So it's not just a free ride for the drug deals. We've increased penalties on that, but we've tried to fund in programs that have, have helped people. And not just Brockton, it's happening whether you're in Wellesley or Newton or such wealthy communities or Brockton and Abington. Abington next door to Brockton, highest opiate addiction percentages of deaths in the Commonwealth. Higher than Brockton percentage-wise. It's a small community. Down the Cape and Hyannis is another big problem. Not just here in Brockton, but we've worked to address these things, and we've worked with the city council, and we appreciate your input because, you know, I, I hate to use the cliche with the Patriots. They don't win alone with just Tom Brady. They've got a great team. We are a great team here in the community of Brockton, and I need your help as well. You giving us the input. My door in the state house is always open. I've had meetings at the council in Aging Brockton and all the other towns that I represent, and it's not been easy. I've seen the same things that were mentioned here. I drive up, I live right up the street off of Pleasant Street. I've seen the people hanging around that intersection as well. We do need more police coverage there and down on Legion Parkway. And it's the sad part is some of the businesses are operating a nice business. It's the people hanging around outside. And there's a there's a gentleman that has a alcohol addiction. I picked him up off the street in Legion Parkway. He lost his son. And, and it breaks your heart. He was a business owner. His son was doing very well in school. And the gentleman's heartbroken. And I constantly see him hanging around. And I, I've picked him up and called the fire department to pick him up. And it's an unfortunate revolving door. But uh, we are trying to get more funding for Brockton. There is more money in the budget this year. And with the help of Jerry Cass and Claire Cohn and Rep. Dubois and myself, Things are moving forward to get more funding, and funding isn't the only answer because we've got to make sure the funding is spent in the proper direction, but there's also other ideas we can do. We need to bring more jobs. The, the, and whether you're in favor of against a casino, up on the North Shore, the, 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 the law in the state is to approve up to three casinos. doesn't mean they have to approve three. They can op only approve one or two. Up on the North Shore, they created over 10,000 jobs building a building up there, and back when I was on the city council, when Jack Eunice was a mayor, we got 90% reimbursement to fill five elementary schools, which was a need for the schools, but not only the construction jobs and union and good paying jobs we had, and there's ways to bring revenue in here too with other job creation. So any ideas you have, please don't hesitate to contact me. My door is always open, and I'm very grateful for the effort we have from our local officials in, in our state delegation, our federal delegation, but no one can do it alone. And, and I mentioned this election, no matter who you're supporting, they watch us at the federal level and they watch us at the state level, who's voting and who's not voting. So if Brockton's numbers are saying, oh, the voting levels are down, they're not going to pay attention to Brockton, and neither will our governor. But if we get large numbers coming out and vote, that governor's got to pay attention to us in Brockton because he's going to say, Jesus, they're voting strong in Brockton. We better pay attention. He's made a lot of good initiatives, but these cuttings of these colleges were not beneficial to us all, and that was a huge need for Brockton. And, you know, I grew up when the high school was downtown in Brockton. You lost all that foot traffic. When the malls get built and these strip malls, are really, you know, that hits downtown. But there was a great initiative to put a college collaboration downtown as well as Massasoit Community College, which would have brought a lot of good people investing in their own lives to better their lives and helpfully get good jobs out there and invest in the community. And we've got to fight to get those back in. So. Thank you. I'm sorry it took so long. I know Monahan usually gets a hook on me when I start going off, but um, <laughs> but please contact me anytime you want. Uh, my office is always open, and we're always looking for new ideas, and we are trying to get more ideas into the Commonwealth. We lead the nation in life sciences and all this, and we have a great program. You can do a two-year program of life sciences and math, right? then go on to Bridgewater or UMass, and it works, and it's helping people get good jobs and if there's a good economy and good jobs, it keeps the other characters off the street. So thank you. Okay, Thanks, uh, you're running for re-election, so I figured I'd give you a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, gone. Anyway, uh, and one more. We have just a little update from Rob May, our city planner. He'll be quick. <laughs> the best for last. I hope. Um, I just want to let you know that uh, the waitresses will be by shortly to take your breakfast orders. Um, I realize we've been going long and, and, and hard here. We got the chicken, so we got the eggs. Yeah, we got the eggs. 
Um, first off, uh, I do want to say happy Pride Month to our LBGT community here in Brockton. Um, also, a quick update on projects that are going on downtown. Uh, the parking garage, uh, which is funded both by uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the Mass Works program and uh, the city of uh, Brockton through a, a bond offering. We have selected a project manager, uh, Colantonio is the name of the company. We are working on early bid packets for uh, superstructure, so that's all the port in place material. And the mayor should be announcing a groundbreaking in September. I won't take all his thunder, but since he's not here, what the heck. <laughs> um, Lincoln School. Um, the city is in the process of selling Lincoln School. We're working with uh, the buyer who is... Um, uh, NeighborWorks. Thank you. NeighborWorks. And God, I never expected a mind <laughs> to remember that. Um, we're working with NeighborWorks and um, uh, Housing Solutions for Southeast Mass. Uh, they're looking at building, uh, rehabilitating the building to historic standards and creating um, 39 uh, senior housing units. And we'll be having a community meeting in July, August? August? Yeah, I think August. He says August. Uh, they're working with... Um, Let me go with that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a community meeting. <laughs> Uh, coming up, Friday the 13th of all days, uh, is the opening day of the Farmer's Market. Uh, the Farmer's Market is sponsored by Good Samaritan Hospital, uh, Harbor One Bank, the Mayor's Office, and Fuller Craft Museum. And our market manager, John Van Kuyken, is here. But uh, we've passed out flyers and to all the tables here. These also went home with all the school kids. Um, talk about the, the uh, Farmer's Market. Uh, I want to... Special thanks to uh, Representative uh, Jerry Cassidy and the whole Beacon Hill delegation for expanding the Healthy Incentive Program uh, program uh, this for this next year. Um, we're using uh, funds to increase uh, people's purchase of fruits and vegetables uh, from low and moderate income uh, households. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, kids' activities this uh, current year at the farmer's market. So every day there's a different activity. At 11 o'clock there is a free lunch program for school aged children. And there is also <coughs> a um, uh, uh, entertainment uh, concert series at noon. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read my notes and people are texting. <laughs> uh, Prava is coming up um, this, this uh, summer. Uh, it'll be uh, starting on Thursdays and Friday nights, or afternoons, evenings, from uh, 4 to 8. It's at 121 Main Street. It's the old Kresge building that got torn down. Uh, where Prava is a multicultural pop-up event activity uh, that includes entertainment, food, and, best of all, beer. Uh, Shoveltown Brewery is uh, uh, one of our main sponsors. Uh, each night we'll have different entertainment, different activities. Uh, there's different areas to hang out in, in that area. And there is uh, the municipal parking lots on um, Frederick Douglass Way are uh, free after 5 o'clock. So you don't have to be too far from your car. And then lastly, we have a two-way traffic program that's coming up. Uh, we're working on the, the study as a data collection over the summer. We are putting together a... Uh, advisory group and we'll be asking both board counselors to appoint uh, a representative of the community to the advisory group and I'll be asking one of the ward counselors and unfortunately he's left already um, to uh, serve on the committee and we expect a uh, meeting sometime early this fall for the community to hear our um, analysis and where we go from there so thank you for this opportunity and have a great evening Fast. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap. Oh, unless you have any questions for me. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't add, you know, how many more questions do you guys ask? Good job tonight. I think you saw really, uh, and I think the mayor and the police department saw really what seems to be the issues that are concerning everybody these days. So I think you got your message across. We're going to be doing a lot more, um, we'll have a few more meetings. I know downtown development is, as a Rob's, Rob said we have that problem thing down. I met with uh, 
I met with him today. Actually, are looking for people to uh, hire for entertainment for it. So it's going to be a pretty, pretty good thing. Lynn Smith will be down there singing, I think, too. Yeah. Which, which night is that? Okay. Anyway, all right, well, thanks again for coming. We'll have another meeting in another couple of months, and hopefully everybody have a good summer. Thanks. You, um,